this morning. We want to hear God speak. And that's the reason why we came, wasn't it? I mean, that's the reason why you're here this morning, is you want to hear God speak. That's the reason why you came. Now, there are exceptions for all those teenagers who were drugged by their parents to the worship service. You may be questioning whether you actually want to hear God speak or not. Most of us want to hear God's voice today. That's why we're here. That's why, I mean, there's other things you could have done this morning. You could have slept in. It's not real hot outside, but you could have done something out in the yard. But you said, no, I want to set aside this time because I believe God is going to speak to me this morning. You know, I was thinking as I was, as I was praying this morning, do you know that if a child, if a child stood up and read the word of God, and the Holy Spirit was working and revealed the word of God, just read it, and the Holy Spirit was working and revealed the word to the hearts of the listeners, that would mean more than if a learned man got up and spoke and just expounded the word of God without the presence of the Holy Spirit. That child reading and the spirit revealing is much more powerful. So this morning you come and you say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me your word. I'm listening. My ears are open. I want to hear what you have to say. For with that attitude, I'm convinced you will hear from God. God will speak to you. And it will be powerful. More powerful than somebody standing up, expounding even eloquently, without the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, my speech was not eloquent when I came to you, but I came to you in power, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what's important, that our ears are open. Matt Lauer on the Today Show in July, July 4th, 2003, he interviewed a traveling minister. And the minister said during one of the church services, it happened to be a Tuesday evening, a thunderstorm came up while he was preaching a sermon on redemption from sin. And so as the thunder, thunderstorm moves in, he's preaching on the redemption of sin. He, the pastor, the traveling minister, told the congregation that God can speak in many ways, many different ways, including through thunder. And he asked God at that point what he wanted to say to the congregation. And boom, big thunder burst and lightning struck the steeple. Now they didn't know they were inside the church building. They didn't know the lightning had struck the steeple. They only heard the thunder clap. Boom! God, what do you want to say to this congregation? Well, they just carried on with the service. Pretty soon a passerby saw a fire and the steeple came running into the congregation and said, your steeple's on fire. Get out of there. Everyone made it out safely. Everyone was fine. The fire was put out. No one was hurt. But let me ask you, have you ever wanted God to speak this dramatically to you before? Now, granted, I don't want them to burn your house down, okay? I, that's not what I'm talking about. But have you ever been, either opened up your word at home or in a church service and wanted God dramatically to speak to you? He can, and he will. And I believe he'll do it this morning. We're going to be in the book of the Revelation. And let me mention, just before I, before I forget and I get going and I forget what's, what I wanted to mention to you, we started last week the Revelation, which means there's only one sermon that was preceded this one today. You normally get every Sunday a handout, which means you'll have in your hand, front and back normally, fill in the blank sort of thing so you can kind of keep up with what's going on and, and have something at home. If you were to take these handouts, put them somewhere in a folder or a binder somewhere, that when we're finished with the revelation, I don't know how many months it's going to take. We may still be at come Christmas next year. I don't know where we're going to be. God knows. He only alone knows. But when we do finish the revelation. If you'll keep track of all these sermon handouts, you'll have a good study guide to reflect back on or look to when, you, when something comes up and you say, oh, I remember Pastor Mark talked about that. You can flip through your little book and you can look at that sheet and then you'll have a reminder or a little study help. So I would encourage you, file them away somewhere. Buy maybe a little notebook like this to put them in or a larger notebook so that you'll have a nice study guide for the book of the Revelation when we're all finished. This morning, as we proceed on, we're going to look in John, uh, Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, verses 4 through 8, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. I hope that you have your Bible with you. Open up your Bible, please, to Revelation chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, there's a pew Bible in front of you that you're, you can use. Please do. It's on page 1028, 1028. So we're only going to look at five verses this morning. It actually is the greeting, the salutation 
right here with a doxology, or in this case, I've broken it down into two doxologies that we're going to see right here with the last part talking about the sufficiency of Christ. There's great evidence that we have that leads us to believe these first five or these five verses, uh, starting actually in verse number four, the grace to you and peace, all the way down to verse number eight, was used in the early church as an introductory greeting. In other words, you would come into a worship gathering, and then there would be an introductory greeting, and they would use this passage of Scripture as an introductory greeting for the congregation. We call it today a responsive reading. In other words, one person starts, the, normally the person standing up here leads it, the one who reads aloud reads it aloud, and then the congregation, those who hear, repeat back another phrase, and it's called responsive reading. So we're going to try that this morning. I've got it up on the screen. I'm the one who reads aloud. Kind of got that one. And then you'll see the one that says, those who hear. That comes from verse number three. Remember, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. So we're going to practice what the early church practiced and use this as an introductory greeting, and then also to give you kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about this morning. So we'll start. I'm the one who reads aloud. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, everyone who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. So. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. According to verse number three of Revelation chapter one, I have been blessed and you have been blessed. And as you act on what you just read, the blessing comes to fullness in your life. An introductory greeting in the first century church. Let's move on and expound those verses that we just talked about right here. We're going to start in verse number four. Verse number four, and we're going to look at the greeting here in verse number four to the first part of five, or what I call it 5A. We could divide verse five into two, 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 two sections. So from four to 5A is John's greeting. So we've talked about it now. This revelation that we're looking at here is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is an unveiling, a discovery, an unearth, not unearthing, but, a, but a, a revelation, an opening of who Jesus Christ is. It's all about Jesus throughout the whole revelation. It's not about us, but it's about him. It's to reveal him in his ascended glory and as he comes again to reign on the earth. It's all about Jesus. Thank you, Doug, for that song. It's all about Jesus. So the first part here, verses 4 and 5a, is the greeting. So we see here, verse number 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. This is the modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of of the kings on earth. So here we see this, this salutation, this greeting from John. The author again is named. Verse number one, we're told it's John. Verse number four, we're told that John's the author. But for the first time, the people who are to receive this letter are mentioned. The seven churches that are in Asia. Now, we're not told about these seven churches until verse number 11. It mentions the, the cities that the seven churches are located in. Now, we need to understand there were more than seven churches in this general area. But these seven churches, the Spirit said, write to these seven churches. It's important that these seven churches need to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So these seven were chosen out of the number that were in Asia Minor during that day. So this we see, John to the seven churches, is, it's a common salutation, a common greeting. It's used, uh, for example, grace to you and peace is used multiple times by Paul in many of his writings. He'll open up and say, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This one's a bit different, though, because it's followed by a threefold divine source where our grace and peace comes from. Three places, we're told in the text. Him who is, 
and who was and who is to come, the seven spirits who are before his throne, and Jesus Christ. This word seven, the number seven, Paul, uh, excuse me, John uses this symbolically significant number 54 times in the Revelation. He uses it over and over again symbolically to symbolize certain things. And the thing that he wants to symbolize is fullness and completeness with this number seven. So the first source of our design, uh, divine grace and peace comes from he who is and who was and who is to come. So this is a common phrase. You remember in the days that Christ lived on the earth, in the days following the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, and as his apostles went out and preached, there were Jews who lived in the land of Israel, Palestinian Jews. Then there were those Jews who lived outside of the land in Greek-speaking countries. These were called the Greek-speaking Jews. And those Jews that lived outside the land, the Greek-speaking Jews, often called God the one who is. That was their title for God, the one who is. And I remember they would never use that divine name, Yahweh or Jehovah. They would never use that name. That was too sacred for them. So they would give him the title God, the one who is. So for the Greek-speaking Jew to hear this introduction of the one who is, was, and is, and is to come, automatically thought of God. It automatically thought in their mind, ah, this is talking about God. And this phrase, the one who is, comes from the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And that phrase in the Septuagint from Exodus 3.14, this is familiar to you. You know this one. God said to Moses, I am who I am, the one who is. And he said, say this to the, the people of Israel. I am, or you could translate it, the one who is has sent me to you. So in the Greek-speaking Jewish mind, this title, the one who is and is to come, is Definitely talking about God, God the Father. He calls attention to his eternity and his unchangeableness. The one who is and who was and who is to come. He's eternal. He's unchangeable. And then we have the phrase, the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God. Now the phrase spirits of God is found nowhere in the Old Testament. You're not going to find that phrase in the Old Testament. Now, the word spirit, or the phrase spirit of God, is used multiple times in the Old Testament. The word spirits, plural, is never used of angels at all in the Old Testament. Now, when we come to the New Testament, the word spirits sometimes have an adjective evil spirits. We see in the Gospels and in some of the epistles of Paul, the word evil spirits, or in the book of the book of Hebrews, is talking about ministering spirits. So it is referring to angels in the New Testament. Old Testament, you don't see any pictures of angels as spirits. The New Testament, they are definitely ministering spirits in Hebrews chapter 1. So there are two views of who these seven spirits are before his throne. The first view is this, that it represents the Holy Spirit in his fullness. Remember, complete, full is number seven, the symbolic meaning of the number seven. So the idea is that it represents the Holy Spirit in his fullness. And the idea is taken from Isaiah chapter 11 verses 2 and 3, where there's a sevenfold blessing of the Holy Spirit upon the Messiah. So the idea of the seven spirits who are before his throne, the sevenfold blessing that comes upon the Messiah. Now, if you take this view that it's the Holy Spirit in all of its fullness, it fits perfectly between the Father, and then we have the Holy Spirit, and then we have the Son. So it fits perfectly between God and Christ forming a Trinitarian statement. God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. Very similar to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So you see the idea of this Trinitarian statement found in 2 Corinthians 13. So it's used in the New Testament often. Now, the second view is this. The second view that, it, that comes, we get it from the idea from the Dead Sea Scrolls where the word spirits is used as angels. So this view says that the seven spirits are seen as the seven principal angels of God. And there's a reference in Revelation chapter 8, verse 2, to these angels of God. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now it appears in context, if you take this all in context, as a doxology. First beginning, forming doxology, and coming down into the second doxology... The idea of a Trinitarian statement, the idea of the fullness of the Holy Spirit fits best in context right here than the idea of seven principal angels of God. 
So the view that I'm going to take this morning is that this is referring to the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So we see the Father, the Spirit, and the Son right there here in these verses. So the first, full, the first divine source of grace and peace was God the Father, and the second was the Holy Spirit, and now is the third, Jesus Christ. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. So we see here three central features in the story of Jesus, listed out here, expounded before us right here in verse number five. First of all, Jesus Christ is called the faithful witness. This speaks about his life ministry. He came to bear witness of the Father. How many, how, when did he say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? So he came to bear witness of what the Father wanted humanity to know. He was the faithful witness. In all things, he was obedient to the Father. And everything the Father asked him to do, he did. It was his life ministry. And the end goal, the end, the end purpose of his life was to give his life for the sheep. So being the faithful witness, he was a faithful witness unto death. So this is the first feature of the life of Christ is his death, his death. The second thing in the text tells us he's the firstborn from the dead. Now you remember Lazarus was raised from the grave and Jesus also raised other people. Well, these people went on to die again. When Jesus Christ came out of the grave on the third day, he never will die again. He lives eternally and sits on the right hand of the father. He is the firstborn from the dead. This is speaking about his resurrection. And the third aspect, or the third central feature in the story of Jesus, is that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is speaking about his future ministry when he comes back to rule, rule the nations in the millennial kingdom. He will be the king of kings and lord of lords. He will rule all the kings of the earth, his future ministry, or his exaltation. So the three aspects we see in the, in the ministry and the life of Christ is his death, his resurrection, and his exaltation right here in verse number five. What's interesting, if you think about it, remember the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness? Spirit sent Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Remember one of the temptations? What was that? One of the temptations was this. Satan said, Jesus, if you bow down before me and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. For they are mine to give to whoever I will. So what he's saying to Jesus is, listen, you can avoid the cross if you'll bow to me right now. You can avoid the shame and the suffering if you'll just worship me right now. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. You will rule the kings of the earth. I can give it to you. They are mine to give. But what did Jesus do? He said, you should worship the Lord God and him only shall you serve. He resisted Satan and the word of God. But the temptation for Jesus was avoid the cross, avoid the suffering, avoid the humiliation, and you'll be exalted without humiliation, without humbleness. Paul was really good about explaining to us the, the attitude of Jesus Christ. In Philippians, he said, he, that's Jesus, humbled himself, how? By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, suffering, shame, cross, humiliation, humbleness. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. It's the principle in the word of God. Exaltation always follows humility. It's never before it. And the world around us, your workplace, the idea there is make your elbows wide or elbogen bright, Gila. Elbogen bright. Make your elbows wide as you go through this world, pushing people out of the way, climbing over the top of people up that corporate ladder. That's the attitude of this world. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about you as a person. I'm exalting myself. Jesus gave us a principle that exaltation always follows humility. Never before. He said in Matthew 23, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Or Peter tells us in 1 Peter, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Exaltation always follows humility. The world has it backwards. And fortunately, it pushes on us and says, this is the way to get to the top. And God says the way to get to the top is humility. 
and I will exalt you at the proper time. F.B. Meyer, who was a preacher of the last century, wrote, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves, one above the other. And the taller we grow, the easier we can reach them. Now I find that God's gifts are on shelves, one beneath the other. And the lower we stoop, the more we get. Exaltation always follows humility. It's a principle we see there. Let's look at the first doxology, verses 5, the rest of 5, and verse number 6. Now, many times you'll see this as one doxology. I've broken it down into two doxologies. So let's look at this doxology, the first one here, verses 5b and 6. So a doxology then, it ends with an amen and gives glory to God. It's a doxology. So last part of 5, verse 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom... Priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now there are five doxologies, maybe six, because I broke this one up into two. Five or six doxologies in the Revelation. Five listed, and again, I've broken this one down into two. And what I want you to notice, the doxology is always giving glory to God, praise to God, lifting God up on high. What I want you to see, look at the text, and you look at your Bible. To whom are we praising here? To whom are we praising? 5b in verse 6. Say it again louder. We are giving praise to Jesus. We are lifting Jesus up on high. God alone is worthy of worship. We are lifting Jesus Christ on high. It is a doxology to Jesus. Jesus is the one receiving praise here. For he did three things for us. First it says, To him, praise to him, that loves us. Praise to him that loves us. Now I have to think of John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. To him that loves us. And the second thing in the text that tells us, to him who freed us. Who freed us. He freed us from our sins. How did he do that? The text says, I know you have your Bibles with you. What does the text say? Look at your Bible. How did he free us from our sins? By his blood. The Old Testament sacrifices were always about blood. Well, there were other ones that were grain offerings. But the atonement, the one for sin, was always about blood. Blood had to be offered in the place of the sinful man. And now we have Jesus Christ who freed us from our sins by his blood. It's his precious blood, that perfect blood. Notice here in the text that love is in the present tense. And freed us in the past tense. So that means Christ freed us once for all, but he loves us always. The freedom came when we came to faith in Jesus Christ, forgiveness of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice on the cross. But now we live in the love of Jesus Christ our entire life and all into eternity. He freed us once for all, but loves us always. And the last thing in the text that says here, the one who made us. Who made us what? Two things in the text. He made us first a kingdom. We live in God's rule. God is our king. He is our sovereign. We are his servants. We are his subjects. We live in his rule. We are in his kingdom. Colossians 1.13, Paul says it like this. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. God is our king. We are in his kingdom. We live in God's rule. And the second thing that he made us was this. Priest to God. We are priests to God. And this is a universal priesthood. You know, many times people think, well, the person that's standing up behind the pulpit, that's the priest. And the people sitting in the congregation, they're just the lay people. They're the congregation. He's the priest. We're the lay people. We want, to, we want to make it perfectly clear, John says to, to you this morning, is that Jesus Christ made you, us, priests. We are priests before God. Every single, there is no one person here as a priest and everyone else as lay people. We all are priests before God. Every single one of us. You function as a believer in Jesus Christ as a priest of God. It's a universal priesthood. And we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices. We are to give our, our bodies as living sacrifices. We are to give our possessions 
as offering. We are to give praise as offering, the praise of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We offer spiritual sacrifices. And what's the extent of our praise? The extent of our praise, how far does it go? What's the extent of his dominion and power and glory? What extent, how far? Forever and ever. And if we wanted to drag it out, and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's look at the second doxology, verse number seven. Oops. You already read that, First Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession. You belong to God and are his priests. Look at verse number seven. I, I call this a second doxology. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So here's the second doxology. Now this verse right here is a blend from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, and Zechariah chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. These two sections in Daniel and Zechariah are blended together right here in this verse number 7. It's also blended together in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Jesus is talking, he says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, here's a blend of Daniel chapter 7 and Zechariah chapter 12, blended together. This idea of coming with the clouds or coming on the clouds is a messianic term signifying power and authority. Cloud in the Old Testament, as the children of Israel wandered around in the desert, by day the cloud was over the, the tabernacle, by night it was a pillar of fire, showing the presence of God. And when the temple was dedicated, the Shekinah glory, the cloud of God, fell upon the temple where the priests couldn't even go inside the temple because the glory of God was present right there. So in the idea of clouds, it signifies power and authority. And what I want you to see in verse number 7 is that this is a universal significance. A significance. Every eye will see him. Every eye. We're told, even those who pierced him. Now this could mean the Jews because they gave him over to death, or it could be the Romans who actually carried out the execution of Christ. Probably means both, because that's the theme of this section, a universal significance. We're told all the tribes of the earth will wail or mourn because of that. In the verse uh, in Zechariah chapter 12, it's the Jewish nation that will mourn, and they will mourn from sorrow because they miss their Messiah. They will mourn, they will see him and say, oh, man, why were we so blind? He was the Messiah. So they will mourn from grief and sorrow over missing their Messiah. But the nations of the earth, for we were told that all the tribes of the earth will wail, will mourn. The nations will wail because they know that judgment accompanies Jesus' coming. They will mission to save. He's coming the second time in power to judge. To pass judgment upon those people who will not believe. He's coming in judgment. And the church needs to wake up and realize we have people that live around us who do not know Jesus. They have never met him in a personal way. They have not even heard how to become a believer. And when Christ comes back again, he will come back not to save them. He will come back to judge them. And what a great motivation for us as believers in Jesus Christ to tell others to care that they need to hear. Because he's not coming back a second time to save. He's coming back in power to judge at the end of this verse, it says, even so, amen. This even so literally is an emphatic yes. You ever heard a teenager when something went well? Yes. Yes. They know how to do it. They know exactly how does it go. Yes. Okay, I did it wrong. Sorry about that. Yes. This is what this is saying. This is an emphatic yes. So we as believers, we hear this verse. The nations of the earth will wail and mourn because they know judgment is coming. But you and I who are believers in Jesus Christ, what do we do? Yes. Amen. Let me hear you say it. Jesus Christ is coming. Yes. Ah, amen. That's what it means. Even so, yes, we can't. Aren't you sick and tired of wickedness in this world? Aren't you sick and tired of a judgment that never comes when people get away with wickedness? I am so fed up of sin. Even so, yes, amen, he's coming back someday. Mary Lou Carney was listening absentmindedly to the television one day. 
She was getting ready to go to church. She was getting dressed. And suddenly over the speakers, a voice announced, next Sunday will be judgment day. Her ears perked up at that. What's that? And then the announcer went on and she felt a little more at ease. The announcer went on and said, the four top teams in football will meet in competition. Judgment day will be preceded by preparation week. Wouldn't it be nice if we knew exactly when Jesus Christ was coming back? Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if we got a clear warning about when he would return? Yeah. Judgment day is coming, but it will be preceded by a preparation week. We don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. We just know that he is coming back. And what we're living in right now is preparation week. For judgment is coming when Christ comes back. We're living in preparation week. We are prepared by being in Christ. Let's look at the last thing here. The sufficiency of Christ in verse number 8. Two doxologies, greeting two doxologies, and now verse number 8, the sufficiency of Christ. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This phrase, I am the Alpha and Omega, occurs three times in the Revelation. Twice in reference to God, God the Father, chapter 1, verse 8, what we just read right here, and chapter 21, verse 6. And one time in reference to Christ, chapter 22, verse 13. So this phrase is interchangeable between God the Father and God the Son. Both terms, both phrases can apply to either the Father or the Son, for we see in the Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega. It is a clear title of deity. Hear about God the Father, and in chapter 22, verse 13, about the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Son. You're probably familiar that Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, first letter, and Omega is the last letter in the alphabet. So in essence, you could say this. In Christ, in Jesus Christ, that's Genesis, the Alpha of the Old Testament, and Revelation, the Omega of the New Testament, meet together in Christ. The last book, Revelation, presenting to us man and God reconciled in paradise. As the first book presented man at the beginning, innocent in God's favor, in paradise. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I am the beginning of the alphabet. I am the end of the alphabet. I am the Alpha and the Omega. You know, our alphabet that we have, the English alphabet, it's a great way to communicate. I mean, we can communicate. Husband and wives, you know how we communicate sometimes without words? You know what I'm talking about? That look? That look? But if we want to communicate in words, we need a written language. We have to have words to communicate thoughts. And our alphabet, the English alphabet, is a great way to communicate. All the words that we have in the English language are made up of the 26 letters we have in the English alphabet. We can communicate every thought by using our alphabet to form the words. That's the importance of what an alphabet is about. It communicates thoughts. At the end of this verse number 8, we read the phrase, the Almighty. Almighty refers to God's supremacy over all of creation. It comes actually from two words that, that compound together, meaning all, and to rule. So it simply means God rules all. He is supreme. He is the almighty ruler, the supreme partner of the whole universe. You know, sometimes I wonder whether we really believe that. Do you really believe God is your sovereign? Do you really believe God is supreme in your life? I wonder if we really believe that sometimes by the way that we act. You know, other things and people will try to come into our life to replace our lawful king. Work, which is important for us. Family, which is also an important good thing. Both of them are good things. But each one of these things can come into our life and try to remove the lawful king that's to rule over us, God, and replace him by other things, worries, concerns, overworking. Many things try to come in and replace your lawful king. Don't let them, for he is almighty, the supreme ruler of your life and my life. Centuries ago, a small French town was besieged by the Spaniards. Residents were starving. Their famished bodies were ravaged by disease. The situation was desperate. 
The Spaniards shot over the walls a shower of arrows, and to each of the arrows was attached a little slip of parchment paper, promising the townspeople that if they surrender to the Spaniard rule, their lives and property will be spared. Surrender up to the Spanish rule, and you will be spared your lives and your property. The mayor of the town tied a piece of parchment to a javelin and hurled it back at the Spaniards. On the parchment was the message, Regum Habamus. We have a king. And every time one of those things or one of those people comes into your life that tries to replace your lawful king, you shout back at them, I have a king. Go away. God is the supreme ruler of my life. I have a king. So we could say it like this when we refer to Jesus and the alphabet. We could say this. Jesus is the supreme sovereign alphabet. Jesus then is everything you need. He is in the English language A to Z. In the Greek language alpha to omega. Everything in between. Everything that your life needs on a daily basis is Jesus Christ. If you need love, when the world rejects you, when no one takes you into their confidence and spends time with you and says you're important and you need love, you can find it in Jesus. If you need comfort when you're mourning, when someone is lost to you or something precious is lost to you, if you need comfort, you can find it in Jesus. If you need forgiveness, when you say, oh, I've just blown it, God, I took a misstep again, how could you ever forgive me? When you want forgiveness, you can find it in Jesus. If you need acceptance, when the world thumbs their nose at you, treats you as unimportant, unimportant. If you need acceptance, if someone says, come into my confidence, I need you because you're important to me. If you want acceptance, you can find it in Jesus. If you need strength to live your daily life, when everything seems to be piling on top of you, you can't, it's one of these pylons, and you're saying, I can't breathe. You need strength. It's in Jesus. If you need understanding and wisdom for your life, you don't know which way to turn. Where can you find it? You find it in Jesus. If you need a purpose for living, what's it all about? Why am I here? It's in Jesus. If you need daily bread, provisions for your life, for your sustenance, you can find it in Jesus. If you need joy, oh, when you're so crushed by the world and joy seems so far away, you can find joy in Jesus. If you need life, abundant life, true life, not existence, but life, you can find it in Jesus. Jesus Christ is everything you need. He's sufficient for your life. You know, I don't think we believe that. And you know how I know that we don't believe that? Do we really find everything we need in Jesus? Or do we have to add to Jesus in our lives? When Pastor Mark says Jesus is sufficient for everything in your life, he's the Alpha and the Omega. He is all sufficient for you. Do you really believe that? Or do you tend to add something to your life? And this is what I'm talking about. When, when you are tempted to worry, or you're under stress, or you're fearful, afraid of something, how do you handle that? When I say Jesus Christ is sufficient for everything you need, how do you handle these things that are an everyday part of our lives? Stress, fear, worry, pressure. Too many Americans tend to self-medicate themselves. Stress comes, they turn to drugs. Fear comes, they turn to alcohol. Some people, when stress and fear comes, overeat. Some people get angry all the time. They're just like a fuse that, I mean, they're so short, you don't even have time to light the thing. Boom, they just blow up and they abuse. Some people spend money. Oh, I'm down, I'm going to go. I have a friend like that. I don't know why she does that. She gets down and she goes, not my wife, not my wife. She gets down and she goes shopping. 
We tend to self-medicate ourselves when these things come upon us. We don't turn to Jesus and count him all sufficient in our life. We medicate ourselves. And Americans are conditioned to selfishly provide for themselves. Got to look out for number one. That's the mantra you hear in the workplace. So when things go badly, we look to help in ourselves, strengthen ourselves to fix the problem. And it's wrong to think that our strength is sufficient. Jesus Christ is sufficient for you. Your strength and my strength alone is not sufficient. You know, it's at times when we think our strength is sufficient, it's like we're, we're like General Custard at Little Bighorn. What do I mean? One of Custard's scouts warned him that they were in for a fight. He estimated that there were enough Sioux to keep him busy two or three days. General Custer replied rather smugly, I'm sufficient in my own strength. He replied rather smugly, I guess we'll, we'll get through with them in one day. He even declined help from the 7th Cavalry or even the aid of a Gatlin gun. I am sufficient in myself. Well, Custer was right about one thing. One day was all it took. I'm afraid we're doing the same thing as American Christians. We're self-medicating ourselves. We're turning away from Christ to find help and strength when we should be turning to Christ to find strength for he is our sufficiency in everything we have and do. What we're basically saying is this. Jesus is fine for my salvation, but I need more for me to make it in life. I need more than Jesus. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Paul says, turn to Jesus. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul says, turn to Jesus. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Turn to Jesus. Worship team, would you come now, please, to close out the service? I thank you for your time this morning as we continue the last few songs and our, continue our worship. Let me just ask you, as the worship team is coming right now, first of all, and I need to ask this every time, do you know Jesus Christ personally? You may have heard about Jesus. You may have even been to church service before to hear about Jesus, but do you know him personally? Have you said, yes, I believe Jesus died for my sins personally. I know that I'm a sinner before God. I need Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus was buried, and I believe that he rose again the third day. I believe those things. And I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior for forgiveness of sins because I know that he paid my penalty on the cross. If you've never done that, now is an opportunity for you to do that today. If you have already done that and say, yes, I know I'm a believer. I know I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you just one question. Are you finding your sufficiency in Jesus or somewhere else? Wrestle with it. I'll pray. We'll give you an opportunity to respond. You don't have to come forward to respond. You can stand right where you're standing when we sing and respond to answer that question before a holy God. My sufficiency alone is in Jesus Christ. Or, Father, forgive me. I'm trusting other things. Let's pray. Father, we, we are human beings. And the humanness and fallenness about us, even as believers in Jesus Christ, Satan hooks into us. He tempts us to turn our eyes away from Jesus and onto things or onto possessions or onto prestige and power, away from what we truly need for life, and that is Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you forgive us. Those times we take our eyes off of Jesus and place them on ourselves or other things and find our sufficiency in those instead of in him. <clears throat> Forgive us, Father. For he is truly the Alpha and the Omega. He is truly the Lord God, the Almighty, the Supreme Ruler of my life. And I want to find everything I need in him, Father, on a day.